Hello and welcome to this session in which we will discuss distributions from corporation. What's the big picture? Well, when the corporation was formed by the shareholders, it was formed by shareholders contributing money and property to form the corporation. And remember in the prior session we looked at section 351 when we said if this transaction is under section 351 it's not taxable. In return, the corporation issues stock to the owners. Simply put, these individuals become owners in this corporation. So this is how the corporation is formed. At some point, money will start to flow also the other way from the corporation to the shareholders in form of distribution. Now, why would that happen? Well, think about what, what was the or original motivation for the shareholders. Why did the shareholders invest in the company? Why do you invest? You invest to earn money, to earn cash. How do you earn the cash? The company operates, for example, every year they prepare an 1120, which is the tax return. They list their revenues, they list their expenses, and hopefully the company will earn a profit. They will have more revenues than expenses. What's gonna happen, part of that profit will be a distribution to the shareholders. Now notice I am being specific in, in using the term distributions because not all distributions will be dividend. So notice distribution is not the same of dividend because the first thing we are going to discuss is the three types of distribution. We're gonna have three types of distribution knowing what type of distribution we are dealing with will determine it's the tax consequences of that distribution. So let's go ahead and get started by discussing the three types of distributions. Before we proceed any further, I have a public announcement about my company, FarhatLectures.com. Farhat Accounting Lectures is a supplemental educational tool that's going to help you with your CPA exam preparation as well as your accounting courses. My CPA material is aligned with your CPA review course such as Becker, Roger, Wiley, Gleam, Miles. My accounting courses are aligned with your accounting courses broken down by chapter and topics. My resources consist of lectures, multiple choice questions, true-false questions, as well as exercises. Go ahead, start your free trial today. The three types of distribution are, first is dividend, two, recovery of capital, three, capital gain. So any distribution might be classified under any of these categories, and there are different tax consequences. So we're gonna learn what each category is and how do we determine whether a distribution is dividends, re recovery of capital, which is we're going to abbreviate as ROC, or capital gains. What is dividend? Well, div dividend could be cash dividend, so they could pay you cash dividend. Dividend, they could give you a property dividend, some sort of a property, or they could give you additional stock in proportion to your current position. So if you own 10% and they distribute 100 different stocks, you'll get 10 of them. And we're going to talk about each one of those separately in a separate session, whether it's cash, property, or stock. How do we tax dividend? Well, it's a long-term capital gain, which is at the alternative rate, as long as the dividend is considered a qualified dividend. And what we mean long-term capital gain could be 0, 15, or 20%. I hope you know this. Otherwise, go to the alternative rate or qualified dividend rate. Or... The dividend is could be ordinary dividend, which is non-qualified dividend. And if it's non-qualified dividend, guess what? It's taxed at the ordinary rate. The ordinary rate is the highest level of dividend. The, the distribution might be considered recovery of capital. What is recovery of capital? Recovery of capital means we are giving you your money back. Do you remember here at some point we contributed at the beginning when we formed this corporation, we contributed cash and property. What we're saying here, if it's considered ROC, this distribution is giving you back your money. And if we are giving you back your money, that's a recovery of capital. Recovery of capital is not taxable. It's recovery of the basis. It's a tax-free transaction. Now, if it's not dividend, if it's not recovery of capital, and we're going to see what determine whether it's a dividend or recovery of capital shortly, then it's capital gain. Usually, it's long-term capital gain. It's also taxed at the long-term capital gain alternative rate, which is the same thing as qualified dividend. 
And why, when is it capital gain? We're going to have to determine when for each one. Now, let me tell you from a motivational perspective, what do investors prefer? Well, investors would prefer the least the distribution to be classified as a dividend. So as a shareholder, they don't want the distribution to be classified as a dividend. Why? Because if it's ordinary dividend, it's going to be ordinary income. If it's qualified dividend, they will have, you know, a lower rate. Nevertheless, they have to pay taxes on it. So this is the least des desirable category by the shareholder. IRS knows this. IRS loves to classify every distribution as dividend. Well, what's the most desirable one for shareholders? You guessed it. Recovery of capital. If the distribution is considered recovery of capital, it's tax free, not tax fee, tax free. In other words, you are not paying any taxes because they are giving you your money back. And shareholders loves it. IRS hates it. And in between, second most desirable for, for shareholders is capital gain. Because capital gain, we know it's if as long as it's long term, we assume it's long term, it's taxed at the alternative rate, which is 0, 15, or 20%. Now we need to know what's going to determine whether a distribution is dividend, recovery of capital, or capital gain. In order to learn this, we have to learn about certain terms, starting with a term that we called current earnings and profit. That's going to lead us into something called EMP, earnings and profit. So we're going to look at something called current earnings and profit, which is going to lead us to something called earnings and profit. What is earnings and profit? Earnings and profit is the company's accumulated capital. What is that? So this is a new term, earnings and profit. What is earnings and profit? Think of it as retained earnings from financial accounting. What is retained earnings from financial accounting? Think of it. It's not the same. Think of it, and you're going to see why. In financial accounting, what we do is we generate revenues, then we deduct the expenses, and hopefully we have net income. What's going to happen to that, to that net income? Net income goes into retained earnings. In, in other words, we're going to keep this income unless we pay it in dividend. And if we pay it in dividend, we're going to deduct the dividend, then we're going to have some retained earning left. Then the following year, what we do is we generate revenues minus expenses, we get net income again. And that net income will be added to beginning retained earning. And if we don't pay dividend, again, the process repeats itself. So this is what retained earning, the earnings that we are keeping, retained earnings. Now, in taxation, we have this term called earnings and profit, earnings and profit. Again, think of it as retained earning, but it's not the same. What is it then? It's the company's ability to pay dividend without impairing its capital. What does that mean? It means, what is the company ability? What is the ability? Notice the ability. Do they have the ability? Do they have the capacity to pay dividend, to pay you dividend without touching the money that you sent them? the money that you contributed to them. Well, where does the money come from? If you did not contribute it to the company, where is it coming from? Well, it's coming from their earnings. Well, okay, then that's easy. Then what you're telling me, earnings and profit is the same thing as taxable income. No, no, why? Because you're gonna see many reconciliation, but let me give you an example, quick example to kind of scratch the surface here. Think of muni bond interest income. When we prepare our 1120, when we prepare our 1120, we're going to report all our revenues minus the deductions. And we're going to get to a profit of 100,000. Including in this revenue was 300,000 of revenue. But the company also had, for the sake of illustration, 10,000 of muni bond, muni bond interest income. Well, hold on a second. They only reported 300,000 of revenue but they also received a check from a state government for interest rate interest income that they received well this ten thousand is not included in this three hundred thousand because it's not taxable it doesn't go on form 1120. well nevertheless we receive the money so that's why what we say earnings and profit is the economic ability to pay dividend therefore what we have to do we have to go with okay if taxable income is a hundred thousand now we're going to do we're going to add to it the ten thousand dollar of municipal bond that we did not account for now this is i gave you the simple adjustment but there, there's going to be many many adjustments some of them are pluses some of them are minuses to come up to earnings and profit so this is the point it's not only taxable income it's more than taxable income it's the capacity to pay dividend and there are two categories 
of to earnings and profit. Current earnings and profit, C, E, P, and A, E, P, accumulated earnings and profit. So we have to understand what is C, E, P, what's current earnings and profit, and what's A, E, P. Well, if you understand what C, E, P is, you're going to easily understand what A, E, P. So let's discuss C, E, P, and accumulated earnings and profit. Well, what is CEP? CEP, as I told you, we start with taxable income. That's the starting point. Then what we do, we have to have some reconciling item and we're gonna spend a few minutes discussing the reconciling item. Sometimes we're gonna add the taxable income, sometimes we are going to deduct from taxable income. So current earnings and profit reflect the effect of current earnings operation on dividend paying capacity. So CEP tells you how much from this year you increase your dividend capacity or you reduce your dividend capacity. Usually if you if you made a profit, you increase it, usually. Here's what's going to happen to CEP. CEP at the end of the year is closed to AEP. So what does that mean? It means whatever CEP we have at the end of the year, we have to close it down to zero and goes into AEP. Therefore, the beginning of CEP every year is zero. Why is it zero? Because whatever is left at the end of the year, it's closed into AEP. What's AEP? Accumulated. What's, what's accumulated? It's undistributed earnings from prior years. And this could go back as far as, I believe, 900, uh, early the 1900. I'm going to see the, the specific year on the next slide. So undistributed earnings from prior year, it means how much the company is keeping in profit from year to year, not only in profit and dividend paying capacity, because remember, AEP is the accumulated of CEP. So dividend capacity from prior years. This is where it's parked in AEP. Now let's discuss now a little bit more in specific current earnings and profit. CEP. How do we compute CEP? And this is the heart of this session. How to compute current earnings and profit? Well, Always we're gonna start in theory, the balance at the beginning of the year is zero. Why it's zero? Because we're gonna close this account at the end of the year. So we're gonna start with taxable income, whatever taxable income is coming from 1120. We're gonna look at the 1120. You're gonna be giving taxable income. Then we are gonna be making certain adjustments to taxable income. We're gonna call this reconciling item. So we're gonna go from beginning CEP, which is basically zero, corporate taxable income plus or minus certain item end up with current CEP. Now, if we pay any dividend, let me just real quick, if we pay any dividend from CEP, we're going to deduct that dividend and whatever's left from this number, whatever's left, whatever's left from this number goes to AEP, accumulated earnings and profit. There are two type of reconciling items that we have to be familiar with and we're going to look at them in examples. Some items are excluded from taxable income that does affect current earnings and profit. There are certain items that you don't see on the tax return. You don't see on the 1120. They're not on the 1120, but they affect your ability to pay dividend. Those items could be pluses, those items could be minuses. What could be some examples? I already told you, tax exempt income like municipal bond. You don't see it, you don't add it as revenue on the 1120, but it is indeed revenue. You receive the money, but it's not taxable. Life insurance proceeds, if it's for the benefit of the one of the executives, if the company received this, it's a plus, you have to add. Federal income tax refund from prior years, this is called like a time and adjustment. So from the prior year, you overpaid your taxes, now they're giving you the money back. Well, if they give you the money, remember you did not deduct the federal income taxes, now you don't have to include it in federal income because it's a refund. You receive the money, you add it. What do you deduct? Well, access charitable contribution. Remember, when you make a charitable contribution, let's assume you made a million dollar worth of a charitable contribution. Of that one million dollar, you might be able to deduct 800,000 only because that's 10% of your taxable income. You are limited. Well, but you wrote a check for a million. Well, it means you have to deduct an additional 200,000. Although it's not on your 1120, but I did make that payment. Now, you're gonna see that this excess charitable contribution, when you deduct it later, this 200,000, it's gonna be a positive adjustment because you deducted it from a prior year. Now you're taking a deduction without paying. We'll, we'll look at an example. Federal income taxes is the classic one. This is the classic example. 
What, what do I mean by classic example? Remember, when you file your form 1120, you're going to have to pay your income taxes. Let's assume your income taxes are 150000 So you wrote a check for 150000 to the federal government, and you send it with your return. But if you look at your 1120, at your form 1120 tax form, you never deducted this money. You cannot deduct your federal income taxes on your federal income tax return. Duh, this is your bill for that, right? But did you pay it? Sure, I paid it. Therefore, what do I have to do? I have to deduct it when I'm computing my current earnings and profit. Interest that you paid on tax-exempt interest. Well, remember, tax-exempt income is exempt. It says exempt. Well, interest on tax-exempt interest is also not deductible. Well, it's not deductible, but you did pay it. Therefore, you have to deduct it. Same concept applies to fines, penalties, and lobbying costs. All these payments that you made for fines, penalties, and lobbying costs, they are indeed real money. You wrote a check for them, but you could not deduct them on your 1120. Therefore, what they all do, they reduce your dividend paying capacity. There are also other items included in taxable income that does not affect CEP. I'll give you an example, the dividend received deduction. When you prepare your form 1120 and you did, if you receive dividend, the government gives you a deduction, a deduction called the dividend received deduction. That deduction reduced your taxable income. Why? Because it's a deduction. But that deduction, you did not pay a penny for it. It's given by the government. Therefore, what you do is you de add your dividend received deduction because it reduced your taxable income without reducing your dividend paying capacity. Now, the best way to illustrate all these concepts is to work a series of examples. I'm going to start with, with a simple example to show you how to compute current earnings and profit because current earnings and profit goes into determining your earnings and profit, which is very important in determining once you determine earnings and profit, it's going to help you determine whether that distribution is dividend recovery of capital or capital gain. So I just want to under, I want you to understand why we are going through all this trouble to, to understand one concept. It's important. Let's start with the first example. Phoenix paid $80,000 in federal income taxes and also earned $4,000 in tax-exempt interest from the state of Florida bonds. So that's what they did. To compute current earnings and profit, we're going to start with their taxable income, whatever their taxable income is. And what we're going to do from this amount, let's assume it's a million. Just kind of, I should have gave you a taxable income. It's a million. Then I would say, well, they paid 80000 in federal income taxes, but that 80000 was not deducted from the million. I'm going to deduct the 80000 now which will make their current earnings and profit 920000 This is their dividend paying capacity. So they did pay it. It's real money, but it's not deductible. Then we're going to add to that $4,000 from the interest received from the state of California, Florida. So their current earnings and profit for that year, 924000 And this is goes into their earnings and profit. So if they pay anything from this amount for that year, any distribution, the distribution we're going to see later, it's considered dividend. Again, think of the form 1120. Those two numbers are not on the form. Well, but we did make the payment and we did receive the money. Just they're not on the form. Let's take a look at another example. Raven Enterprises transfer a property with a basis of 20 to its only shareholder for 15000 So they have something for 20000 They give it to the shareholder. And the only shareholder. Is this a related party transaction? Yes. Now, what does that mean? It means the company cannot take the loss. As per Section 267, cannot take the 5000 loss when determined taxable income. Why? Because the transaction is between related parties. Did, did the company lose 10000 Yes, they lost 5000 worth of asset. Okay? Giving the overall economic impact of the transaction, a 5000 is decrease in net asset. This loss minimizes current earnings and profit for the sale years. Basically, you lost 5000 but you cannot record this 5000 So I lost 5000 I could not deduct. I'm going to reduce my current earnings and profit because it reduced my current capacity to pay dividend, my current earnings capacity to pay dividend. Sometimes what we have is called timing adjustment. A charitable contribution is a classic example, so let me give you this example and see how it works. During 20x3, Farhat makes charitable contribution 18,000, which of which 
cannot be deducted when figuring out taxable income for the year. Why? Because remember, there is, there is a 10% limitation of taxable income. As a result, the 18,000 carried forward to 20x4. So I made the contribution, I could not deduct it. In 20x3, it was fully deducted in 20x4. Now remember, I have 20x3, I have 20x4. In 20x3, I could not deduct this contribution. So I'm gonna arrive to my taxable income, whatever my taxable income was. Then what I'm gonna do to, to compute my CEP, I am going to deduct the 18,000, and that's gonna give me my CEP for 20x3. What happened is in 20x4, I was able to deduct this 18,000. I deducted this 18,000 to arrive to my taxable income. This 18,000 that was deductible, I arrived to my taxable income. Well, in 2018, it was deducted, but I did not really wrote the check in 20, 20x04. So what do I do? I will add the 18,000 to my taxable income to come up with 20x4 current earnings and profit. So this is called the timing adjustment. Why? Because the excess contribution did affect my 20x3 earnings and profit and also affected negatively, it affected negatively 20x3, but it affected it positively in 20x4 when it was permitted to be deducted without me writing the check in that year. So no, remember, I wrote the check in 20x3. I took the deduction in 20x4. It doesn't matter. We have to understand this timing adjustment. Now, the same concept would apply to net operating loss and capital losses carryover. You're going to take them in different years. Make sure which year you deduct them to add them back. Sometime what's going to happen with CEP is you have to make certain accounting method adjustment. Because when you compute CEP, you might have to use different rules. Think of CEP as using different accounting rules. And we have to look at few accounting, different accounting rules. That's not all of them. At some point, I will have a list of all the adjustments. But let me show you a few accounting rules. The installment method is not allowed for EMP calculation. So if you sell something and you said, I'm going to be using the installment method, that's not allowed. What's going to happen for that year, you're going to assume that you receive the, all the amount. So it's not allowed. An adjustment is required for the third gain from annual property sales under the installment method. Simply put, the installment method means you made a sale today, this year, so you made the sale, but you are going to be receiving the money the next three years, year, year two, year three, and year four. You made the sale in year one. Well, guess what? Although you're gonna be receiving the money in year two, year three, and year four, we're gonna, for CEP, all the principal payment considered in the year of sale. So we'll look at an example, but this is what I want you to know. It's not allowed. You say I'm using the installment method. It does not matter. Also, for earnings and profit, when you compute earnings and profit, you cannot use maker. So if you have any depreciation, you have to recompute re your depreciation using the alternative depreciation rate, ADR. We'll work an example. Also, Section 179 deduction is spread over five years. So if you took a Section 179 deduction for tax purposes, they're going to say, no way, you cannot take the full deduction for EMP. What you have to do is you have to only take prorated over five years. It means every year you, have, you can only take 20% of the deduction for the purpose of CEMP, which we will look at examples. Also, you cannot take first year depreciation. So if you took a first year depreciation, you have to make an adjustment for that. It's not allowed for CEP. The best way to illustrate all of this is to look at examples. Let's assume starting with the installment method. In 20x3, Sparrow Company, a calendar year taxpayer, sells a tract of unimproved land for 180,000. The basis in the property is 40,000. For the terms of the sale, Sparrow would receive 100,000 in X4, 80,000 in X5, along with the interest of 5%. And Sparrow does not opt out of the installment method. They want to use the installment method. Now, remember, I don't care what they use for tax purposes. They want to use the installment method. That's fine. But when I'm computing my CEP, I have to assume what? I have to assume the whole sale took place in 20x3. Okay. Since Sparrow taxable income for 20x3 won't reflect any gain from the sale, the corporation must make 140,000 positive adjustment. Hold on a second. The sale was 180. Why is it 140? 
Well, that's the deferred gain. Remember, we sold it for 180. The basis was 40,000. So we have a gain of 140. What's going to happen? We're going to take this gain and say this is a positive adjustment to CEP. Hold on a second, but it's not in my taxable income. I don't care. As far as dividend paying capacity, you made the sale. Now, what else do we have to do now? We have to compute the gross profit margin on this transaction. So we made a profit of 140 on a sale of 180. The profit margin is 77.78 rounding, rounding. This is rounding. It's 777. It's rounding. So here's what's going to happen. In 20x3, in the year of sale, nothing was taxable, remember, because you're, they're using the installment method. Under the installment method, you wait until the payment is made, then you compute your taxes. If you don't know the installment method, you gotta, you got to know this. But for EMP purposes, I have to add. It's added. Therefore, I have a positive adjustment for the year of the sale, although I did not receive a penny yet. But installment method, those are the rules. It's called an accounting adjustment. For 20x4, you received $100,000, the first $100,000. How much of that $100,000 is taxable? Well, remember, you receive a cash of $100,000. The profit on this is 77.78. It means on your taxes, you are going to report $77,778 in profit that's taxable. That's great. It's going to go on your W-2. It's going to increase your taxable income. And that year, in 20x4, you have a negative adjustment because you already added all the profit from this transaction in 20x3. Therefore, you have a negative adjustment of EMP for 20x4. 20x5, you received $80,000. You received $80,000 in 20x5. Well, if I received $80,000 for tax purposes, I'm going to multiply it by the gross profit percentage for this sale, which is 77.78 rounding, and that's going to give me a profit of $62,222. Boom, that goes on my W-2. I have to pay taxes on that. On my EMP, I have to deduct this $62,222 because this whole amount was added to EMP in the year of sale. So notice, if you add those two, they, they should equal to $140,000, just FYI. Let's take a look at a depreciation adjustment because that's important. Remember, what do we have to use? We have to use ADR. Let's assume on January 2nd, Silver spent $50,000 to acquire an equipment with an ADR midpoint of 10 years and Maker's class life of seven. So for Maker's, it's going to be seven years. For ADR, it's going to be 10 years. It's going to spread over more years. It's more conservative. You're taking less deduction. The equipment was depreciated under Maker's and the asset was sold on July 2nd, X3. So X, so we kept it X1, full X1, X2, all the way till mid X3, and we sold it for 45,000. Now let's compute the depreciation for both. So now I'm assuming here you know how to use makers. Obviously you should, okay? So now for 20 X1, we'll take 50,000 times year one makers for seven year, 14.29. The depreciation for makers is 7,150. So on your form 1120, you took a deduction of 7,150. Great. For the uh, for ADR, it's 50,000 divided by 10. Then it's considered mid-year. So it's ADR mid midpoint life times one half. You took a deduction for ADR, not ADS, ADR of 2,500. Here's what you did. You took an excess deduction. You took, you took too much deduction. You took too much deduction for makers because you took 7,150. What we're saying is since you took too much deduction for makers, we're going to add back 4,645, the difference in the depreciation method. For year X2, take 50,000 times year two seven year maker rate 24.49 for makers you took 12245 for the adr method it's 50000 divided by 10 we have a full year we took 5000 once again you took for makers you took too much deduction 12245 we're going to have a positive adjustment of 7245 for 20x3 we took 50000 times 17.49 and it's going to be 8,745. Then 
we are going to take 5,000 divided by 10 times one half, which is gonna be 2,500 because it's a mid-year, we sold it mid-year. So all, all in all, the depreciation is for makers, total of 28,135, the depreciation for ADR is 10,000. The difference between them, overall, we had a positive adjustment of 18,135. Now bear in mind for 20X3, we multiply this by one half. I don't have the one half here, but we multiply it by one half. Now, when we sold it, remember when we sold this asset, we sold it for 45,000. So what does that mean? It means we have to compute the proceeds amount realized minus the adjusted basis under each method. Well, the amount realized, whether it's for income tax or, or for EMP purposes, it's 45,000. This is how much we received for this asset. Then we are going to do what? Deduct the adjustment, the, not the adjustment, the adjusted basis. Well, what is the adjusted basis for income tax? Well, the asset has a cost of 50,000. We already took 28,135. Therefore, the adjusted basis is 21,865. So we made a profit of 23,135. Why? Because the basis is, is 21,000. The difference between the amount realized and the basis is the profit. Now, for ADR, we the, the cost was 50,000. We only took 10,000 of the appreciation. The basis, the adjusted basis is 40,000, 45 minus 40,000, we have a profit of 5,000. There's a difference in the profit between the income tax and AEP. Well, if we compute the difference in the profit, guess how much it's going to be? It's going to be 18,135. And that's gonna be a negative adjustment. So notice, as we were depreciating the asset, we had a positive adjustment of 18,135, but that positive adjustment was recaptured when we sold the asset. Why? Because for income tax purposes, we have a higher profit. For income tax purposes, we have a higher profit. Why do you have a higher profit? Because the basis is higher. We have a higher basis. So therefore we have less profit. For for EMP, we have a higher we have we have lower profit because the basis was not eroded. We only eroded five thousand of the basis. Well, we have a negative adjustment because it we recapture the depreciation when we when we make the sale. Let's take a look at section 179. Remember section 179, what do we have to do when we have section 179? We have to spread the expense over five years for CEP. On January 2nd, Azure put a five-year depreci depreciable asset into service. The purpose, the purchase price was 50,000 and the company claimed section 179 for the entire amount. Well, it's five years starting with X2. In year X2, they for tax purposes, they took the deduction. They happily took the deduction, 100,000. How much can they take for EMP? Well, it have to be spread over five years, which is 20%. We have to deduct from EMP only 10,000. It means, so let me show you this. On 11-20, we had revenues <coughs> and we had expenses. Part of this expenses was this 50,000. Now, then we got the taxable income. Now we're going to have to go from taxable income to CEP. Well, of this 50,000, we're only supposed to deduct 10. So what do we have to do? We have to add $40,000 to taxable income. So if we add $40,000 to taxable income, add 40,000, so minus 50 plus 40, the net deduction for EMP is only 10,000. This is how we came up with the, the 10,000 for year one, but the adjustment is for 40,000. Now, X3, how much can we how much can we deduct for tax purposes for this asset? None, because the full amount was deducted in X2. So in X3, what we do now, we deduct the 10,000 because remember the 50,000, the 50,000 asset will have to be spread over 5 years. So we did year 1, year 2 10,000, year 3 10,000 and the adjustment is 10,000. Okay? So keep that in mind that for year 1 you'll take the difference. And we'll work another example, but I hope you can see this, that in year one, we only have to take an, the EMP adjustment is for 40 to make it net, the difference is 10, to only have a 10. Why did, we, why did we have a positive adjustment? Because we took too much deduction, we have to add back. 
we have to add back the 40,000. So for EMP, the deduction should be only 10,000, the effect on the adjustment. Then in the following year, every year you will deduct 10, 10, 10. So notice the adjustments pl plus 40, notice here, plus 40, let me just show you here, plus 40 minus 440, basically the adjustment is zero. And what you did is you, for tax purposes, you took it all in one year. For EMP, you took the deduction over five years and the adjustment basically canceled each other out. Now. The only reason you're gonna learn how to compute CEP is to work additional examples. And this is what I would do. I would look at additional simulation and exercises that's gonna help you understand this topic. I also have plenty of MCQs through false on Farhat lectures. This is where you should go now and work MCQs. Good luck, study hard. This is an important topic and stay safe.